everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. This here was an Atari 65 XE that got a refurb and a few upgrades. But one thing that I haven't focused on yet is the video output. Now this already has the Super Video mod, which is better than stock, but it's not great. But what I'm actually gonna be using today is this, a 130 XE, and it looks terrible but so does the video output quality. So seeing as this is in completely stock form, this is gonna be better to base our mods on. Then we can look at maybe fixing up the super video mod a little bit. Now, it's a very simple procedure. I am gonna go into a bit of detail, but there is not much to it. Literally, we're gonna need two resistors and a small piece of wire and that should get us a very nice looking video output. Now there are other options out there like the Ultimate Atari video and there's even the Sophia which gives you DVI output. But I'm keeping this one very simple and literally cents worth of parts. So um, let's get stuck into it and see what needs to be done. I'll um, have a summary at the end of this video if you wanna do it yourself. Right, so we've got our stock 130XE, which is hooked up to a very cheap and nasty capture device. Uh, the good thing about that is I can grab screenshots directly, and it's not doing much filtering to the signal. So hooking it up to a TV or something, or a retro tink, usually will do some filtering. So this is a good way to see exactly what issues there are with the video signal. Now, of course, the other things we're gonna need are some schematics, and you can pretty much ignore this mess because this is what I was using to figure out this mod. So we will start fresh. And the other thing we're gonna have is an oscilloscope. So let's just bring it up at the ready prompt and just have a look at what it looks like on the screen and also what it looks like on the scope. And then using the schematics, we'll figure out what we should do next. Right, so our scope probe is hooked up to the end of R204, which runs straight over to the DIN output. So this is our Luma and Sync signal, and it's being fed into a 75 ohm impedance, uh, which is what you'll commonly find with almost every display device. So looking just at the ready prompt, there's not really that much to see. I mean, it's a little soft, there's a bit of noise and there's some jail bars. There is also a checkerboard pattern going on in there. Um, so let's bring up an actual test pattern just so we can get a better idea of what the issues are. All right, so we've loaded up the Atari control picture and we're looking at the Luma and Sync signal on the oscilloscope. And it doesn't look too bad. There is a little bit of noise there, but all in all, it seems to be within spec. We've got about 1.04 volts peak to peak. Uh, the Luma and Sync standard should be one volt peak to peak, so it's pretty close. And if we go and look at just the Sync on its own, it is, uh, it's about 400 millivolts peak to peak. The standard should be 300 millivolts, so we're actually not seeing the full amount of Luma uh, utilized. So if we measure just Luma on its own, we can see that from the bottom to the top is about 600 millivolts peak to peak, whereas we wanna see 700. So we're not seeing the full scale of black to white in this signal. Looking at the schematics, this over here is our Luma output transistor. So what it's doing is it's taking the Luma signal from the GTIA and also the CD4050. And that gets fed into the base. Think of this as sort of like anything that goes into the base is just sort of being sampled. Uh, it's not actually driving the output. What drives it is the supply coming into the collector. And we can see right above the collector, there is a 51 ohm resistor. So that's actually limiting the current, making it into the collector and could effectively be causing the transistor not to be able to operate at its maximum potential. So 
first things first, we're going to take out this R116 51 ohm resistor. And the easiest way to do that is just to bridge a wire across it. So that's where we're going to start. Now, I'm not sure why Atari put it in there in the first place. My thinking is that it could be because it needed to comply with some FCC regulations, which were pretty strict at the time. And putting that resistor in there effectively limits the bandwidth of the Luma signal. So that could have been why. Maybe it's just to protect this transistor from a short circuit on the emitter, but it's already running through some other resistors before it reaches the DIN output. So even if you had a short over here, it probably wouldn't draw enough current to actually destroy this transistor, even if that resistor wasn't in place. So I'm thinking FCC regulations, but who knows? You can see down here, this is our color output transistor and is directly connected to five volts. So they didn't bother putting one in there. So I don't know why they put one here, but that's what we're gonna tackle first. We're just gonna jump this resistor and see what that brings us. So the resistor in question is this guy right here. That's our R116 51 ohm resistor. I'm actually gonna flip the board and jump it from the other side just to keep everything a little bit neater. And if we look along here, these are our rows of resistors and it is the fourth one along. So all we need to do is jump that. And to do that, I'm actually gonna use one of the resistors that is gonna come in handy later, but I'm just gonna steal a little bit of its leg. So we'll come back with this guy later, but for now, that's it. Might just add a tiny bit more solder just to neaten that up. Make sure it doesn't try and escape. Cool. So that has effectively jumped this resistor here. Let's take a look at what effect that has on our video. Right, so just looking at the ready prompt, the text for ready actually looks a lot sharper. It may have made those jail bars a little bit more prominent, but we will sort those out soon enough. Uh, let's have a look at the Atari control picture. Right, so comparing the Atari control picture from before to now, you can see that there's quite a bit more sharpness to everything. Even the colors, how they step up in brightness, you can see there's an obvious transition between each one. And in terms of the top right uh, grayscale step, you can see that it's definitely a lot whiter than the previous image. And looking back on the scope, we can now see that the Luma has gone up in intensity. So, so before it was at about 600 millivolts, now it seems to peak at almost 800 millivolts, which is actually too high. So overall, the entire signal is close to 1.2 volts, which is 200 millivolts over what we want. So the next thing to investigate is this resistor here, R204, which is what we're currently hooked onto. If we increase that, that should bring down our voltage level to something closer to spec. Now, it's not a big deal for most displays, they'll handle that extra 200 millivolts, but it doesn't help when the display is trying to work out how much of that signal is sync, what should be black, and what should be our whitest white. So we do wanna get that as close to spec as possible. So what we're gonna put in there instead is a 68 ohm resistor. Let's just pull the old one out and I'm going to do this the lazy way and just heat the pads from the top. Just like that. Trim these legs.
All right, and our 68 ohm resistor is in. Let's have another look. And looking back at the scope, we now have a nice one volt peak to peak signal. Our sync may still be a little bit high at 320 millivolts, but that could just be due to some noise that I'm accidentally including in that measurement. And our actual Luma looks to be around 672 millivolts. So definitely very close to that 700 that we were aiming for. So I'm pretty happy with how the Luma and sync has turned out. So, so far we've jumped R116 and we've replaced the 47 ohm at 204, R204 with a 68 ohm. There is still some more work to do because I can still definitely see that there's a checkerboard pattern in the color and there's still quite a bit of noise and potentially some jail bars in there. So let's look at the color side of things. Uh, so we are going to grab our signal from this side of R205, which heads straight to the DIN. R205 is this guy down here. So we can see that the color output signal on the scope is about one volt peak to peak. Now, keep in mind that the 65XE came out around 1985, and that's about four or five years before the S video standard. So this thing isn't trying to comply with the S video standard. It's more likely that they were trying to comply with the Commodore video standard. Around this time, the Commodore 1700 series monitors were around and they accepted one volt peak to peak on both the Luma and Chroma inputs. So it makes sense that Atari also aimed for that. I think Atari did plan on actually bringing out their own monitors and may have done so, but predominantly the consumer monitors that had a Chroma and Luma input would have been the Commodore 1700 series. So yes, again, I don't think Atari actually got it wrong here. It's just that that's what was around at the time. So that's what they designed their machine for. But the S video standard says Chroma should be at 286 millivolts. Now, I actually only found this out recently. Previously, I used to aim for 700 millivolts and it wasn't until I looked at a service manual for one of the CRTs that I have here that I realized that it wanted 286. And following on from that, I found more service manuals and things that specified 286. So the 700 millivolts actually came from what I thought was a pretty reasonable website and manufacturer. Their website said 700, so that's what I thought was correct this whole time, but it turns out everything pretty much aims for 286 on their Chroma inputs. So I will have to go revisit some of the other mods that I've done, but for now, let's get this Atari to output our correct Chroma voltage for S-Video. Now, one other thing you'll notice is when it comes to our color signal, it's not actually determined by a voltage level in this case it's determined by a frequency level so even though there's a bunch of different colors on the screen they all look pretty much the same on the scope if i zoomed in far enough we may be able to tell the colors apart but that's not really what we're trying to look at here we just want to get that output level correct so once again in order to adjust this output level we're going to change out the output resistor, which in this case is R205. And I've determined that an 820 ohm resistor should be ideal. So let's swap out R205, which is a 150 ohm for a 820 ohm. Again, I'm just pulling this out of the top of the board. And yes, I have already damaged this board board by doing this. Um, so you probably should do it the proper way, but damage is already done now. Oops, that's the 47. We don't want to put the 47 in. Now. 
And actually the way I determined all these values wasn't by simply swapping out resistors. I actually put a couple of leads in the resistor holes, stuck them into a little breadboard sort of thing, and then used some 2K trim pots and just adjusted them until I found what looked right on the scope and then measured the trim pot to determine what the resistor value should be. So now looking on the scope, it's about 274 millivolts, which is only 12 millivolts off. And there's still a lot of noise in there. So it's not perfectly accurate, but it's about as close as we can get. Looking at the actual image quality, we can now see that that checkerboard pattern is pretty much all but disappeared. So usually that's a fairly telltale sign of when the chroma voltage is too high, you'll end up with checkerboarding. And it's just a matter of getting that back within spec. So now we can see that the color isn't bleeding out as much. Um, it's a little bit more refined. Now there is still a little bit of interference and it's actually pretty hard to see on this Atari control picture. So let me bring up something else. Maybe even if we just have a look at our ready prompt. All right, yes. Looking at the ready prompt, we can definitely see the noise is actually a lot more pronounced than it was before we started. And that's just due to us sharpening up the image. So sharpen up the image, you're going to sharpen up that noise as well. Now there is one more thing that we can do to trim down that noise. Let's just update our schematics again. So that is now an 820 ohm. Now, when I was coming up with this modification, I did test out different power supplies. At the moment, this is simply running off a five volt USB power supply, but I do have the original Atari linear power supply that made no difference to the signal. I changed out some of these filter caps around the area that made no difference. I even attempted to jump some of these ferrite beads and even jump over some of these coils that made no difference apart from making things potentially worse. What I found was that there is a lot of ground noise around this 4050 chip. Now this pretty much is a buffer for the Luma signals. So they all come out of the GTIA and head straight here. The problem is the ground for this 4050 is very closely shared with the ground for the GTIA and the CPU and the, is that the Freddy? Is that the Freddy? Is that the Antic? Doesn't matter. So these all have a lot of digital noise going on. So as our signals on these go from zero volts to five volts quite rapidly, that introduces some noise into our ground plane. Hence why you'll see RAM chips that have these little bypass capacitors on them. It's to sort of try and mitigate some of that noise and keep the signal nice and clean. If we imagine looking at our scope again, that the ground signal is noisy, then every time the ground signal goes up, that counts as an offset towards what the rest of the Luma and Sync signal looks like to the display. Now imagine that noise happens at the same time every scan line. When that gets sent to the display, what you're going to get is an effect where it'll look like there's lines down the screen, like our jail bars. So what we're going to do is just simply run a wire from the ground of this 4050 up to this ground here. That's not going to completely eliminate the noise. Obviously it's a ground plane, so they're all shared, but the difference is rather than having all of the ground shared with this, some of that is also going to be shared up over here, which will eliminate some of that ground noise. Won't get rid of all of it, but it will definitely bring it down a little bit. So you can see even looking on the scope, even though I'm not really measuring the ground in the ideal way, that it is very noisy. 
Let's stick in an extra ground wire and see what difference that makes. So what I'm going to do here is run a fairly short piece of wire because we don't want to pick up extra noise. That is going to run from this point here, which is actually pin nine on the 4050 chip, but that's directly connected to pin eight, which is the ground. So may as well take it from pin nine instead of pin eight. And we are going to run that to this. There, not there, there, not there, there, ha <laughs> ha, there. So looking at it from the other side, our wire has gone from this point here to this point here on our capacitor, which goes up to this big juicy ground plane. All right, so once again, looking at our ready prompt and that image looks a whole lot cleaner than it did before. Likewise, looking on the oscilloscope, the ground noise has been significantly minimized. So one more time looking at the Atari control picture and yeah, I think this is about as good as we're gonna get but it's definitely a massive improvement over what we started with. So let's go back to the 65XE, which as I mentioned, has the super video mod and see if we can squeeze a little bit more out of that too. All right, so I spent a bunch of time stuffing around with the super video modded XE and I determined that the best way to improve the super video mod is to just rip that shit out and do this mod instead. It uh, seemed to be the obvious choice, but I still stuffed around and filmed a whole bunch of stuff trying to improve that mod. But the reality is like it was done at a time where Chroma Luma monitors were common and you couldn't really see that much difference on a CRT, but with flat panel displays now, they show up every tiny bit of interference and noise. So um, yeah, if you've got a super video modded XE, pull it out, swap it for this one, let me know how it goes. So to summarize how to do this video mod, we want to replace R204 with a 68 ohm resistor, R205 with an 820 ohm resistor. We want to jump R116 and we want to add a wire from pin eight of the CD4050 over to a ground point near the RF modulator. And that is all you have to do. So. It is a simple video mod, so I guess the best name for it would be simple XE video mod or maybe SXE for short, sexy. So that's about it for this one. I'm very happy with how the video mod turned out. There was a lot more involved that I didn't go into in this video, mainly because that stuff didn't work or didn't make a noticeable improvement. So, um. Yeah, that's one of the things that I really enjoy doing is pulling better video quality out of these old systems, along with obviously cleaning them up, which is something that I have to get around to with this one. So um, as always, thank you very much for watching and subscribing. A big thanks to my patrons, especially the Commander Keen patrons. And uh, if you want to support the channel and support further mods like this, um, be sure to check out the patron links below. So as always, thanks for watching the Retro channel. I think we'll end this one here with a demo from the mid 90s, which I think is only 16K in size. And it has a really awesome gritty soundtrack and really shows off the video output from these things. So. Let's leave it with that one. Hopefully YouTube won't compress the crap out of it and make it look terrible. But if you've got an Atari 8-bit computer, I highly recommend checking out this demo yourself. Thanks for watching the Retro channel. Bye.